Oh, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Are you ready? So I, I will. I will introduce you. Uh, this, uh, okay. Good morning, all the the, the students, and not only all students, but I think so, I'm so uh, other scholars. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So I, I, will, I will introduce you. Uh, okay. Just. A minute. Okay, we, we, we will, I would like to start. So, uh, good morning, uh, everybody. So, uh, for the students and also for the colleges, faculty members from other university, uh, and also good evening to Raj. Uh, so, today, uh, Raj uh, will uh, present uh, the, uh, the class. So, I will, I would like to introduce Raj first. So I would like to introduce uh, Professor Raj. So Professor Raj is uh, Professor Ramaraj uh, Bupati, or I'll call him Raj. He is now uh, a professor of biological sciences at the Nicole State University, USA. I think uh, he received a, a number of the uh, uh, awards and also uh, I think uh, professorships and also uh, presidential award. So in the, Dr. Raj also received the Nicole State University Presidential Award for teaching excellences. And he has more than uh, 30 years of research experience in the area of bioremediation and bioprocessing. Uh, his research involves uh, bioremediation of hazardous chemical, including oil spill, explosive, biological treatment of visual treatment, antibiotic resistant genes in the environment and, and also uh, bioethanol uh, production or biofuel production. And also currently, Professor Rat is a visiting professor at the Faculty of Industrial Technology in, at, at ITB. Uh, I think he was here in the 2019 in, the, in ITB. Uh, he is college of mine. I know him since uh, 1986. So it was uh, more than 30 years. Uh, I would like... Uh, to invite Professor Rice to give the, the lecture on the uh, genetic, uh, of, although it is a uh, really scientist, I think so for the, all the students in engineering background will, uh, will take the uh, message and then the, the importance of the uh, genetic uh, in your work. Please, uh, Raj, the time is yours. All right. Thanks very much, Chandra. It's, uh, um, I'm very happy to be here, uh, even though it's evening, almost dinner time here, <laughs> six o'clock a Sunday night, and good morning to everyone. Um, so as Professor Chandra has, um, um, you know, mentioned that um, today I'm going to talk about, um, basically the talk is on genetic engineering, but I broke my talk into three different um, sections. First, I'm going to do some basic information on uh, the gene, gene structure, transcription, translation, those information some of you might already know from taking microbiology classes. And then I'm going to introduce a genetic engineering concept, how to manipulate genes, uh, and then what kind of various product we can make um, using that. And then the last uh, part is the, the, the new science we call synthetic biology, where you can synthesize your own um, genes and, and produce a lot of products. So I broke down into three different um, categories. So I'm gonna be using three different um, slides, okay? I'm gonna start with my first one. So, uh, so I'm gonna talk about introduction to genes and um, genetic engineering and synthetic biology. Um, if you look at the... Uh, Introduction, uh, this is very common term, most of you know from high school biology. So um, genes are there as a hereditary factor. Uh, you, you have the codes and it's uh, passed on as an inheritance, okay? Uh, so the transmission of all biological traits from parents to offspring is passed on through these uh, genes. Um, the expression uh, and variation of these traits depend on what kind of codes uh, are in those genetic material. And then if the code changes and expression changes as well. 
So just to go basic, uh, you know, you have the organism level, you have different organisms and inside at cellular level, if you break it down at the cellular structure, um, inside the cells and in a, in a um, eukaryotic cell, you have this uh, nuclear membrane, inside this nuclear membrane, you have chromosomes, and in the chromosomes, you have DNA, okay? But in bacteria, which is prokaryotes, uh, which um, don't have the nuclear membrane, and this chromosome is right on the cytoplasm, we call that naked DNA. And this uh, genetic code is on the, on the, uh, on the chromosome with the, in, the, in the genes broken down into various parts in the chromosome. So just some uh, concept of uh, terms, definition, uh, the term genome refers to uh, the sum total of all genetic material of an organism. Uh, most uh, of these genome exist in, uh, and they, they reside in chromosome. Um, some appear in non-chromosomal site because uh, we have in bacteria called plasmid. Plasmids are a tiny extra piece of DNA. And in uh, eukaryotic organism, in some organelles like mitochondria and chloroplast, they have their own DNA. So most of the genetic material are in um, chromosomes. It's not moving. Um, so here's a picture of um, the cell. Um, you can see the cell in chromosome in, in bacteria. You have plasmids apart from regular chromosome. And then in eukaryotic cell, uh, there are some DNA present in chloroplast and mitochondria. And then, then viruses have its own organization of uh, some of them have DNA, some of them have RNA um, that has the genes. Um, so the term genomics refers to study of an organism's entire genome. So, uh, so for, for, for example, human genome project, we know we uh, already um, know all the genes, um, all the nucleotide um, that make a human, and that is called genomics. If a term refers, genomics refers to all the organism's entire genome. Um, uh, as I said, chromosome before, chromosome is a discrete cellular structure composed of neatly packaged DNA molecule. Um, so genes are the basic informational packets. Um, the genes classically defined as functional unit of hereditary, um, but preferred definition nowadays is, is a segment of DNA that contains necessary code to make a protein or an RNA. So that's a, a, a definition of uh, what is a gene, okay? so. Common people know gene is a you know, hereditary function. And a molecular and biochemical genetist says is a site on the chromosome that provide information for certain cell function. But at the molecular level, what is a gene? Gene is a piece of DNA that contains necessary code to make a protein or an RNA. So another term is called genotype. Genotype is some of all uh, genes consisting of an organism uh, distinct to genetic makeup. And uh, that, that it spells out the genes, how they are present. That is called a genotype. The phenotype refers to the physical expression of genotype. When you have the gene, uh, how you look like and what kind of function that genes provide, that is called phenotype. So these are some basic terms. Some of you already um, know about it. Um, so let's look at the, the size of the genome. Um, for example, E. coli, which is a common industrial organism we use in manipulation of gene, gene, genetic engineering, E. coli has only one chromosome and it has 4,288 genes, okay? If you pull out that chromosome out of the E. coli, it's a one millimeter long, uh, although E. coli is in you know, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 micron in size, if you unwound this chromosome, it can be bigger than the E. coli itself. It's a thousand times longer than the bacterial cell. It's a neatly packaged in tightly bound inside the cell and it contains 4,288 genes. On the other hand, human cells roughly have 30,000 genes. So anywhere from 20,000 to 50,000 genes, but they are packaged in 23 pairs of chromosomes are totally 46 chromosomes. So E. coli has one chromosome, human cell has 46 chromosomes, and if you look at E. coli in one chromosome, you have um, 4,288 genes. Okay. Um, 
so here's a, a picture of the E. coli that shows um, um, the bacterial cell and the, G, the chromosome pulled out. You can see that a thousand times bigger than um, uh, bigger than the cell itself. So that's all the gene. I mean, the one chromosome pulled out X and showing how big it is. Okay. So let's uh, just look at the, the structure of uh, um, uh, DNA. Uh, DNA, as I said, is a basic, um, a, uh, the basic unit of a DNA is a nucleotide, like another term. So each nucleotide contains a, a phosphate molecule and a sugar called deoxyribose sugar, and it has nitrogenase base. So this nitrogenase base is the, the basically uh, can, carries the codes, and they are two kinds. One is called purine, another is called pyrimidine. And the purines and pyrimidines, totally we have four of them. Uh, we have adenine, which the latter refers to A, which always pairs with um, a, another nucleotide called thiamine, which is T. So we have adenine is a purine, thiamine is a, a pyrimidine molecule. And we have another um, nucleotide called guanine, which is again a purine, as always pairs with cytosine C. So A always combines with T, G always combines with C. That's how um, in under DNA, you have this uh, 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 nucleotide arranged. So here's a, a structure of a piece of a DNA molecule. If you look at all the parts we, I, I, show, I showed you, we have phosphate molecule, and you have the, the sugar, deoxyribose sugar, and then the nucleotide. You have the pyrimidine and purine, G um, and C, and, and T and A. Um, they combine, C always combines with G, and T always combines with A, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine. And so this is uh, how a DNA is, um, um, structured and uh, the DNA is double helix, which everybody knows. It's uh, you have a um, two two strands that uh, um, you know twist uh, and tightly package inside the cell, and each of those unit is is called a base pair. Okay, one base pair is one pure in another pyrimidine combined together is a base pair. Um, a little bit about some enzymes. There are a lot of enzymes involved in uh, replication of um, the DNA. Um, so here is a listed on this table. Um, so each one has its own function. Um, you have helicase, primase, DNA polymerase, ligase, topi isomerase. And the important ones are the DNA polymerase, which basically add um, the nucleotide during a replication, uh, the base pair uh, to the um, the, the, the daughter uh, chromosome molecule. And of course, the other enzymes are also involved in DNA replication. So when we talk about um, genetic engineering, we talk about DNA polymerase, talk about ligases, and um, we also talk about cutting um, gene, cutting enzyme. Uh, we'll talk about some other enzymes, okay? So the basic function of this DNA, it carries codes, and it, when it is necessary, when the gene is turned on, it's going to make a messenger RNA. That process is called transcription, and this messenger RNA carries the codes, and that codes code for specific protein. Okay, and when this um, code is carried to a, a, a ribosome, and that is where the translation takes place. That's where the actual protein synthesis takes place. So, basically, these um, uh, the, the 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 codes that are residing in a DNA is transferred to a messenger RNA, which is transcription, and then the um, the transcription go the messenger RNA goes to the ribosome where translation takes place, which is basically making a protein. Um, so we're going to talk about how this is done, even though some of you already know about it, just bear with me. Um, so transcription is um, uh, making a messenger RNA, and translation is producing protein. So simple definition. Okay? Um, there are a wide variety of other RNAs that are there to regulate uh, gene function, how to turn the gene on, gene off, and the DNA that codes for these 
crucial RNA molecules are commonly known, known as junk DNA, but there have other functions, uh, but the people finding out every day there are different functions of those so-called junk DNA. Okay? You call it basically intron and exon. Exon are the genes that express something. Intron are spacers in between the gene, and, and those are one time they called junk DNA. Now they're finding out there are a lot of regulatory functions. So this is just to show you the whole process of transcription and translation. Here is the whole chromosome. Here's a piece of a DNA. The first thing when, when this um, uh, organism needs a specific protein to be expressed, the gene will be turned on a specific regulation function. Um, when that happens, um, the first thing it does is it's going to transcribe the code and transfer that code into a messenger RNA. And that process is called transcription. And in transcription, you need these different RNAs. We have a transfer RNA, messenger RNA, ribosomal RNA. And transcription uh, carries this code to the ribosomal RNA. Um, transfer RNA carries the amino acids and messenger RNA is the one that has the uh, codes itself. And then we have a lot of this other RNA that have regulatory functions, okay? So the actual translation takes place in a ribosome when messenger RNA is cut and come to the ribosome. And in the ribosome, we have the transfer RNA comes and carries um, the amino acids for the sequence and put in to make a specific protein um, pr product, okay? So as a transcription part and translation part, those are the major function of how a gene works. So let's talk about um, um, the connection between DNA and organism trait. Um, you know, protein's primary structure is determined by how it is shaped um, uh, in a three-dimensional view. If you look at it, the shape and function of a, a protein structure, uh, protein is ultimately determined by uh, phenotype. Um, so the study of organisms complete set of expressed protein is called proteomics, another term. Um, so proteomics is all the protein that a, a cell can make. Uh, so DNA is mainly a blueprint that tells the cell which kind of protein to make and how to make them and how much to make them and when to stop them. So there is a specific regulatory function that turns the gene on and then turns the gene off. When you don't need that protein anymore, you turn the gene off. So it's completely controlled by a certain regulatory function. So just put all this thing together. Um, if you look at a DNA, every three letter I talked about that CGA, that nucleotide, every three letter on a DNA carries the code, specific code, okay? And that code is on a DNA is called triplet code, where triplet is three, right? Tri means three. And that is, a, um, each one is a nucleotide, three nucleotide in on a DNA is a triplet. When that is, um, message is passed on to make a messenger RNA, that three letter is transferred to make a three more, um, codes transfer, and each of the three nucleotides on a messenger RNA is called codon, okay? So we have triplets on a DNA um, nucleotide, and then that one is, trans, uh, when it is transcribed on a messenger RNA, it is a codon. And each of those three letters, that nucleotide letters, um, codes for specific amino acids to make protein. So here is a, a codon, right? It is another codon, it is another codon, and so on. And each codon codes for specific amino acids. So here is amino acid one to five. And, and what order these amino acids should be combined, those are all specifically coded uh, in this. It passed on to messenger RNA. And when these amino acids are combined together, then you make a specific protein, okay? So this is the gene protein connection. So, so gene carries the code, and through transcription and translation, you make protein. So each three letters on that, um, on the gene is a triplet code and messenger RNA is called codon. 
So I'm going to go through that very quickly and, and show you how this whole function work. Uh, the, the major participation in transcription and translation, there are a lot of um, uh, um, uh, molecules in, uh, involved. They are, uh, first one is messenger RNA that carries the code for protein. Then transfer RNA carries amino acid. Uh, regulator RNA, uh, 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 ribosomal RNA, um, it just should be ribosomal RNA. Um, where the uh, uh, actual transla translation happened, that means actual protein production happened. And then we have several types of enzymes involved, and also you have many um, raw material. That means you need a nucleotide to make the messenger RNA. Okay. All these things are involved in making um, a protein. Okay. So just to put together, um, the different RNA involved. So we have messenger RNA, transfer RNA, ribosomal RNA, and regulatory RNA. There are a lot of different regulatory RNA, and then you have a primer and ribozyme and spliceosome. So the major ones are these three RNAs, okay? And then we have regulatory function of this, and each one has the specific uh, information, what kind of codes they have, how it functions in a cell is listed here. Okay. The only RNA that is um, uh, um, that is controlled um, that is that has this um, thing is the messenger RNA. Okay. So here is a, a transfer RNA. Um, the transfer RNA has this three letter code, and that code is called anticodon in transfer RNA. Uh, for example, um, for um, Adin adenosine in in, um, uh, in in the code always come into the uracil. I'm going to talk about what U stands for. Um, um, uh, so the anticodon will have exactly what to have in codon. So here is a messenger RNA codes. The messenger RNA code A U G. A, a comments with U. A comments U comments with um, A and G comments with C. So here is your co codon, here's an anticodon. And when she reads that, um, then the amino acid is passed on, okay? So it, it transfer RNA has an anticodon, it also has amino acids. So when transfer RNA reads the messenger RNA, it, it transfer the amino acid by reading the codes, okay? Um, Let's look at uh, tools in the cell assembly line. Um, there are difference in RNA structure. Just I want to go through what uh, RNA structure is. RNA is a single stranded molecule and uh, it contains uracil instead of thiamine. So in DNA, you have thiamine. In RNA, you have uracil. That's why the codon has U instead of T, okay? That's your complementary base pair. Um, the sugar in RNA is ribose sugar, in DNA is deoxyribose sugar. That's the difference between RNA and a DNA. And RNA is a single stranded, and DNA is double stranded. Um, so, messenger RNA transcripts of structural genes in the DNA, and it's synthesized uh, in a process similar to the synthesis of leading strand during a DNA replication. And codon is a series of triplet code that holds the message of the transcribed messenger RNA. Uh, again, to go back one more time to show you what tRNA contains, it's a sequence of bases that form hydrogen bond with complementary section of the same tRNA strand, but it carries anticodon. Okay, it's found at the bottom of the loop of the clover leaf structure. Um, and uh, it designates the specificity of transfer RNA and complements the messenger RNA codon. And then ribosomal RNA is a long polynucleotide molecule that forms complex three-dimensional figure. And that's where all this RNA come together. It's like an assembly line. And it, uh, it all the amino acids are put together to make specific uh, protein. So here is a, all of them put together in one place, okay? So the message from DNA is transferred to messenger RNA in the form of every three letters as a code. And that comes to the ribosome. And on the ribosome, um, uh, we have the transfer RNA come and it has anticodon and it also carries amino acid. So here is every three letter is a codon. Here is three letters anticodon. If there is a 
adenine here, the corresponding anticoagulant should be uracil. If it is guanine here, the um, anticoagulant should be um, cytosine C, right? So A, U, um, and C, G, and so on, right? So it, when it reads the correct code, it says, okay, this um, amino acid should be put in here. So the amino acid is cleaved and put in, and then the next um, transfer RNA reads the next code and cleaves that amino acid and put it together. Uh, and, and, and this, right, this uh, is like an assembly line and this um, transfer RNA move into the exit side and, and got out. And then yeah, another transfer RNA goes through this ribosome until it reads a, a code called stop codon and, and the whole thing stops and the uh, protein is cleaved and processed uh, further. Okay, so this is just picture as like an assembly line. All of them get together in the ribosome, and those three uh, RNAs, uh, ribosomal RNA, is a place for protein synthesis. Messenger RNA carries the codon, transfer RNA carries anticodon, and brings the amino acids to make the protein. Um, the actual uh, transcription, I just um, just to show you how the code is passed on. Um, here is a DNA. Uh, when, uh, when the DNA is turned on to make specific um, uh, messenger RNA, uh, the RNA polymerase enzyme come and sits and unwinds the DNA. And in the cytoplasm, we have this nucleotide pool that has all these nucleotide, A, M, adenosine, uracil, cytosine, um, and guanine. So wherever this letter on the DNA, A, U is put together. Wherein, uh, wherever there is a C, G is added together, right? As a result, you have this initiation of um, a messenger RNA made, okay? So RNA polymerase come here, unwinds, and from the nucleotide pool, the codes are read and messenger RNA is made, okay? So every three letter carries a code. So here is uh, the whole process. The, so here is a, uh, Messenger RNA transcript, and every three letter is a codon. Actually, it transfer from a DNA into this messenger RNA. This is the nucleotide pool. All these um, nucleotides are present in the um, cytoplasm. Okay, so initially we start with RNA polymerase, that's called initiation, and then elongation, which is putting together this messenger RNA um, until you see the stop codon. Okay. And that's how the transcription process takes place. Initiation, elongation, and the third one is termination. Um, so once the messenger RNA is put together and when it comes to the stop codon, it says this is where we stop and it's, it cut it off and the messenger RNA cleaves. And this whole process is called transcription, making the code transfer from DNA to, to messenger RNA. This messenger RNA now carries code for specific uh, protein, and this goes to uh, ribosomes for translation, okay? So the central principle of translation is messenger RNA nucleotides reads codons, and the codon dictates which amino acid added to the growing chain. Except for a few cases, this code is universal for bacteria, archaea, eukaryote, and virus. So almost all organisms have the same codes, okay? So this is just to show you the, the basic master genetic code. There are 64 codons in messenger RNA. 61 code, uh, codon codes for an amino acid, specific amino acid. Then we have a one start codon and two stop codon, right? So every three letter, here's the uracil, 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 that codes for an amino acid called phenylalanine. And the letter UUA, uracil, uracil, and adenine, that codes for leucine. So if there are three letters and a messenger RNA like arranged like this, then that codes for specific amino acid. So here is a first letter, second letter, third letter, and you can see various amino acid um, codes and the codons listed here, okay? So you have a AUG, which is the initiation start codon. It also codes for amino acid in the middle of this, middle of the messenger RNA production. And then you have this stop codon, okay? And, um, and it's totally we have 64 codes uh, on the messenger RNA. 
Uh, there are some redundancy put in place. Um, certain amino acids represented multiple codons. You, you can see that there are multiple codes for same amino acids. And uh, just to, you know, it's like a redundancy purpose. Uh, so, and also it allows for insertion of correct amino acid, even if there is a mistake is made in the DNA sequence. Okay. So this is just to show you the whole process again, how these whole things work. Um, so here is your DNA um, triplet codes, um, adenine, thymine, guanine, adenine pairs with thymine, thymine pairs with adenine, guanine pairs with CA. This is your triplet code on a DNA. When this is transcribed, you make your messenger RNA. So we have uh, on the messenger RNA, there is um, the thymine um, uh, should be, uh, you know, match with adenine. And in RNA, there is no thymine. Instead, you have uracil. So adenine match, mag, matches with uracil, cytosine matches with G. So AUG codes for something. CUG codes or something and so on. This is now called codon. And then this goes into, um, uh, uh, then uh, this goes into ribosome and the transfer RNA carries the anticodon. So the anticodon is A to U, U to A, G to C. This is an anticodon. And this also carries amino acids, right? So AUG codes for methionine amino acid, CUG codes for leucine amino acid, ACE codes for threonine amino acid, ACG codes for threonine amino acid. And the anticodon is the same thing for these amino acids. So when these things are lined up, and these are the amino acids that put together to make a sequence of amino acid, to make a peptide, and the, each peptide is a protein, okay? So this is the whole sequence of event that takes place in your body every time, millions of times. Right, and in bacteria it happens. It's almost the same code like we have all this um, uh, this the DNA sequence that specifically codes for as some specific uh, protein. Um, all these elements needed to synthesize proteins are brought together. Uh, you have messenger RNA, amino acid, ribosome, and these are the three event I talked about: initiation, elongation, termination to make messenger RNA. And here is the whole process to show you one more time, the whole process of uh, ribosome where you have messenger RNA come together and you have um, the transfer RNA reads the codon and anticodon reads the codon and get the amino acid cleaved. And the uh, next amino acid put together, the one, two, and then three, four, five more amino acids put together to make a, a peptide, which is a protein. Uh, it's just to show you a long protein molecule build up. Each one is uh, uh, amino acid all the way down. And that is called a peptide, right? And the bond is called peptide bond between each one. Okay. So the things to know is uh, start codon, stop codon, and um, uh, start codon start the process, stop codon stop, okay? If the stop codon uh, comes in the middle of the sequence, then there is a mutation uh, that makes some, uh, instead of putting some correct amino acid, you're stopping it, that's called mutation. And there's another phenomenon called translocation, the process of shifting the ribosome down the messenger RNA strand to read a new codon, that is called translocation. So you see the one uh, transfer RNA comes and another transfer RNA comes. So the shifting of ribosome in between is called translocation. And after the protein is made, there is some tr um, modification done to the protein. That is, you, you cleave the, um, uh, the, the area that doesn't code for anything. That's called splicing of um, introns. And then you have adding some cofactor, adding some phosphate to make phosphorylation to make that protein functional. That is called post-translational modification to make that protein function, okay? And this is just to show the same picture. Uh, it's like a big factory in a cell factory. Then you can see this um, ribosome and the messenger RNA, uh, all uh, like a ribbon sitting on a lot of different ribosome and continuously making protein, okay? So trans transcription, translation in a cell. Is the actual picture of a uh, bacteria making protein. 
And uh, just to very quickly how the, um, these genes are regulated, there are certain regions of the gene um, that has a regulation function to when to produce this protein, when to stop these proteins, and those are called, in bacteria, we call operons regions. And uh, this is specifically uh, controlled by the need of the cell. So you don't want to produce this always, okay? So we have an inducible operon uh, that um, um, codes for a specific enzyme to uh, start the process. Um, operon is sometimes it needs to be induced because when the substrate is present, the substrate itself is going to turn on the gene and it, it has to go to the operon region to turn on the gene. And then there are structural um, uh, gene that codes for a specific function. Um, uh, and so those are all regulated uh, highly in, uh, uh, in, in every cell. Okay. And then we have repressible operon, which is uh, contain codes for you know, anabolic enzymes. Several genes in this series is turned off. That is, uh, when you don't need them, you don't have to make this uh, protein. So it's already in off position. So you need to, uh, have the, uh, uh, the the product itself to make it turn it on. Okay. So you have a regulator gene, you have a, 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 and the regulator gene in the control locus, you have a promoter region and operator region. And then the structural locus is where actual codes are present in um, making a particular uh, protein. So this is given in E. coli, first time described in E. coli, how um, E. coli metabolize lactose and this is called lac operon um, that carries for um, digesting lactose making a specific enzyme. Um, it's just like a allosteric site so when the lactose is present lactose is going to go sit on this um, uh, uh, controller gene and turn the controller gene structure uh, modify the structure so it falls off the um, control region of the gene so the RNA polymerase can come and start the transcription process, okay? So in the next uh, picture, we're gonna show you, okay? So here is a control region of the gene to turn the gene on. So you have a, a regulator, a, a repressor protein sitting on the operator region of the gene. It's stopping RNA polymerase to uh, bind to start the transcription, right? So when this repressor protein sits on this part of the gene, that means the gene is turned off, right? And messenger RNA cannot be produced. There is no transcription, okay? So in this case, lactose, um, when the lactose is available, the lactose is going to go, one of the molecules of lactose is going to go sit on the allosteric side. It's going to change the shape of this repressor uh, protein and it's going to fall off. And then RNA polymerase is now going to sit on the operator region and, and start making transcription uh, process. And then you make mesonar RNA. And then um, mesonar RNA uh, com continues to go through translation and you make necessary enzyme to digest the lactose, okay? When all the lactose are uh, processed uh, by the uh, bacteria, there's no more lactose left. There's one lactose that is uh, sitting on that repressor protein, right? That repressor protein, that lactose is also will be digested by this enzyme. So now this repressor protein goes back to original sh shape. It goes to go back down the operator region and lock uh, RNA polymerase to, you know, go through the transcription. This, when it goes back, when this la last other lactose molecule is digested, then it goes to the off position. So you can see how the genes are turned on, how the genes are turned off by the substrate itself, uh, the availability of the substrate. Um, another molecule is a repressible operon. In this case, the gene is all, always on. Um, so when the, when the expression, overexpression of the gene uh, will turn the gene off, okay? When the product is made too much, and it become the product itself a co-repressor. It will go uh, turn the gene off. So there are two ways to control the gene. One, gene is an off position. The substrate need to be uh, uh, combined to turn the uh, off position to on position. 
And the other one is the, uh, the repressible operon where the gene is always on, but when the product is made too much, the product itself become a co-repressor and turn the gene off. So these are the two major uh, regulatory function of how the genes are turned on and turned off. So here is RNA polymerase continuously producing uh, uh, in a uh, transcription to go on. And then when, when too much of this product are made, and that one other product gonna go sit there and change the shape of this um, repressive protein and, and which can go and sit on the operator and stop the um, RNA polymerase to uh, bind and the transcription stops. So here is the gene is always on position, the product itself become a co-repressor and, uh, and make the genes to turn off. So there are two ways to control. And these are the two basic ways the genes are turned on and turned off. Um, the next process is called recombination. Recombination is an event in which a, a bacterium donates a DNA to another bacterium. The end result is a, a new strain of bacteria. Okay, it, uh, it now possesses a new trait obtained from another bacteria. Okay. Uh, most of the time, a plasmid to plasmid transfer of this um, gene takes place. Sometimes it takes place in extra chromosomal DNA. So every time a new gene is um, uh, taken from another cell, now we call that recombinant DNA, a recombinant organism. So recombinant organisms are organisms that have more than a gene from more than two or more sources, okay? So that process is called horizontal gene transfer. So normally genes are transferred vertically from parents to offspring every time a cell reproduces. Um, in the horizontal trans gene transfer, uh, two adult cells exchanging genes, and, and that is a horizontal gene transfer. Now, this is how bacteria develop um, antibiotic resistance, okay, through horizontal gene transfer from one organism to another organism. And uh, again, plasmids is this uh, small a circular piece of DNA that replicate independently of bacterial chromosome, they allow transfer of DNA between cells. It's found in most bacteria and some fungi, it contains a few dozen genes, okay? And the plasmid genes has no um, uh, gene that codes for any survival function, but it codes for other traits, especially antibiotic resistance, and heavy metal resistance. So the process naturally that uh, uh, makes this horizontal gene transfer are conjugation, transformation, and transduction. So conjugation is, basically like bacterial sacs between one um, bacteria to another bacteria gene is transferred uh, through a appendix called pili or pilus. Um, the pili combine a bridge and then the gene is transferred from one bacteria to another between two live cells. Transformation is a gene transfer from a dead bacteria to live bacteria. When a bacteria die and decompose, the DNA is released into the environment. That DNA is called free DNA. Uh, when another bacteria happened to come by close to this free DNA, if it, if it has a right receptor on its cell membrane, it's going to capture that free DNA and you know put it inside the chromosome, and, and now you can have a new trait. Okay? So when from a free DNA from a dead cell to live cell, a DNA transfer takes place, that's called transformation. And transduction is basically um, an accidental gene transfer through a viral replication. So when bacterial virus replicate from one, uh, replicate from one bacteria to another bacteria, it sometimes accidentally transfer a bacterial gene into another bacteria. So these are the three ways uh, bacteria obtain uh, horizontal gene transfer. Conjugation between two live cells. Transformation is from a dead cell to live cell. Transduction is uh, through accidental gene transfer through a viral replication in bacteria. Okay. So just to show you the same thing I talked about, that's a conjugation uh, definition, okay? And here is how it happens. So here is a, a bacteria through a pili form a bridge and then DNA is transferred from um, donor bacteria to recipient bacteria, and the DNA is substituted in the re recipient bacteria. So you can see that whole process, okay? And this F factor is called fertility factor, and the bacteria that has pili is called F plus, 
the bacteria that doesn't have a pili, which is a hair-like projection, is F minus, okay? So this is called conjugation process. Um, so one of those uh, antibody resistant is commonly transferred through this process and called resistant plasmid or resistant factor. So bacteria develop antibiotic resistance. Um, transformation, as I said before, it is uh, only happens in competent cells. The competent cells has to have right uh, receptor on plasma membrane to, to, to dock that DNA onto that protein to take it inside, okay? So if there is no right receptor, then it doesn't do it. So when the free DNA is available, it captures it and transfer inside and, and, and um, it changes the genetic uh, reorganization. So here is an example of um, a live cell, a dead cell. When the bacteria die, they, it releases the DNA into the environment. This become a free DNA. And then free DNA is now, um, when another live cell come close to the free DNA, if it has a right receptor on its cell membrane, it's going to uh, dox, it's going to sit on it, and then it goes in, inside the cell and it substitutes its own DNA and take this foreign DNA from another source. And that is your transformation process. And transduction, as I said, is a, a, a accidental gene transfer through a virus. That virus uh, in bacteria is called bacteriophage. And here is the picture of it. So when virus injects it, genome into a bacteria for viral replication and it goes into the bacterial genome and bacteria is going to replicate virus for them and sometimes it accidentally takes the bacterial gene with it and and when it reproduces go to the next cell it now injects the, some of the bacterial cell along with viral um, genome into that okay uh, bacterial genome into the, and viral genome combined together into another bacteria this process is called transduction so this is the three processes involved in nature, how a recombinant organism can develop through horizontal gene transfer. Apart from all this, there is another piece of elements called transposable element, and which is commonly known as jumping genes. And this was first um, uh, proposed by a scientist, uh, Barbara McClintock in Iowa State University in Iowa in 1951. She won Nobel Prize for this discovery. And these jumping genes have no particular um, place on a chromosome. It doesn't have a permanent place. It always moves on the chromosome. So every time it moves and, and, and disturbs the arrangement of um, DNA, uh, it's going to um, make mutations. And uh, so that changes the expression of gene. And uh, so this is called um, jumping genes. Okay. So this is how a transposable elements look. These transposable elements have no permanent place on a chromosome. It always moves, shifts, and every time it goes and finds a different spot, it's going to rearrange the whole um, genome, and then that's going to change the expression of the whole organism. So that's uh, called transposable element. So there is um, um, this. These are also called insertion. Element, uh, if the transpose elements are very small, it's called insertion sequence. And then uh, retrotransposon is another term for type of transposable element that can transcribe DNA into RNA and then back into DNA uh, into a new location that is called retrotransposons. Okay, these are some more uh, terms that uh, you need to learn when we do um, genetic engineering process. Okay. And the other transposable element contains genes that code for antibiotic uh, resistant toxin production and all that. So what happens, the general effect of these transposable elements, you scramble the genetic code and you make a mutation happen. So sometimes it's beneficial to the organism, sometimes it's adverse, depending on what kind of shift took place on the gene, okay? where it is relocated, what kind of genes are relocated. Okay. Uh, so most of the time, the transverse element in bacteria change the colony structure, color of the colony in bacteria, um, and antigenic characteristics, and replacement of damaged DNA, and also intramicrobial transfer of drug resistance, basically antibiotic resistance. So that uh, concludes the basic part of um, genetic um, um, 
a gene structure and transcription translation, how bacteria transfer genes. Um, now I'm going to shift to genetic engineering process. Uh, if you have any questions in this, um, I, I, I can open up the question. Uh, do you want me to continue, um, um, Chandra? Or you want me to take questions uh, here? I think, sir. Uh, I think there's, there's a, there are questions. Okay. Uh, the first one is from uh, Tuba Gusryan, uh, Ryan. Okay. Uh, how, to, how to modify DNA? In a micro, it is. It is will be part of your lecture or ne next one. Yeah. Oh, next one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to do that. Uh, and the next slides coming up. This one uh -huh. is just to show all the parts and the component, the process and terms. Now I'm going to talk about genetic engineering. Yes. Okay. Okay. Then I think that from uh, my question is because of it look very complex, right? What yeah. you have been presented is very complex. How this inf information derive? I mean, uh, how the scientists can get the information? They are uh, working like a first one is model and then experiment and fabric. How 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 this this information derive? Because uh, <laughs> it's, it's basically complex. it's a lot of work. <laughs> so you 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 isolate the DNA and then you read the the codes. Uh, and uh, and then you understand what this code stands for. So it's like a 60, 70 years of a lot of people working on this field and okay. put all this together, the language of this um, uh, genetic uh, codes. And for example, the 64 codon uh, that people put together to make for the, which is universal for bacteria to human. And that took, uh, you know, almost 50 to 60 years of research mm -hmm. uh, for a lot of people. And a lot of yeah. people won Nobel Prize. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so okay. doing this work, yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a basic research, yeah. yeah. Okay then. Okay, I think so. Uh, two bogus question will be coming up. Uh, I think in your. Uh, okay. okay. All right. Okay. So, yeah. Let me start the next section. Yes. Which is with, this is genetic engineering. How you manipulate the gene? How you make a desired product? And then the third section is synthetic biology. Okay. Let me open the slide here. Can you see my slides, everybody? Uh, yes, but it's, you can, uh, oh, okay, okay, now, okay. Okay, yes. all right, now I'm gonna talk about how to manipulate the gene and uh, make different product, okay? So here is a DNA toolbox. So, so we call that sequencing of genomes so to, to all the genes that make a particular organism. So people have been working on different organisms and uh, I, I talked about human genome. Now we sequence so many thousands of different bacteria, a lot of different organisms, the whole genome sequence been done. So more than 7,000 species of organisms have been sequenced um, uh, last 20 years, okay? Uh, so we know exactly all the genes for the, to make a human, all the genes that make for several bacteria. So this DNA sequence depend on a lot of modern technology, there's so many new instruments has been developed um, and uh, starting with making the recombinant DNA, okay? So in recombinant DNA, the nucleotide sequence from two different sources um, in put from two different species are put together uh, in test tube, in, vit uh, in vitro, uh, and then you put them in in vivo into the cell, okay? You can manipulate that in, um, in a small centrifuge tube and then you put the bacteria inside and allow the bacteria to take this gene inside. So, so you can manipulate the gene. I'm gonna show you some technique, okay? So methods for making recombinant DNA are central to genetic engineering. If you wanna manipulate the gene, you need to cut, uh, cut the uh, uh, DNA in specific places and insert another piece of DNA into that cut uh, DNA places and then you combine them, it's like uh, putting a, 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 a tape uh, uh, and make a, a DNA again whole. And that DNA, then you reinsert into a bacteria. And, and then that bacteria is gonna hopefully take that piece of DNA and put it into the chromosome. Now it's gonna express whatever the gene you put into the cell to whatever function that you want. Okay, that is basically genetic engineering. 
uh, as a DNA technology has revolutionized uh, biotechnology, now we make a lot of different products. Uh, most of them pharmaceutical industry and agriculture. We make a lot of uh, genetically modified organisms, plants especially. Um, uh, so an example of DNA technology um, in nowadays is microarray, which is uh, on a small piece of, um, um, on, a, on a slide, glass slide, you can measure thousands and thousands of gene expression, whether the gene is active or not active, you can do that. Okay. That's uh, one of the revolutionized um, uh, invention, microarray technology. So this is just to show you on a small piece of slide, you can see more than 3000 genes. Uh, wherever that yellow color means that gene is expressed, the red color is gene is not expressed. Um, so you can, this is called microarray technology. So you can put that on a small chip, all the genes, and manipulate it and make sure the gene is producing messenger RNA or not producing messenger RNA. If it is producing messenger RNA, that gene is turned on. If it is not producing messenger RNA, the gene is turned on. So you can do this nowadays in, and the prices are coming down and you can do that between 100 to $300. Uh, now you can do this. Okay. Um, let's talk about DNA cloning and, uh, and uh, how to do the genetic engineering part, okay? Um, so to work directly with specific genes, scientists prepare well-defined uh, segment of DNA and make identical copies. Uh, and that process is called DNA cloning. So when you make exactly same copy of a DNA, that is called DNA cloning. Okay, They have same information. Um, so most methods of cloning a piece of DNA in the lab have general features. Okay. Uh, you need, you, such as use of bacteria and the plasmids. So bacteria is essential. And plasmids are, as I said before, it's a small circular DNA that present inside the bacteria. And the clone genes are <clears throat> useful, useful for making a particular gene and producing protein product, okay? So gene cloning involves using bacteria to make multiple copies of a gene. So once you put the modified gene inside the bacteria, the bacteria, every time it replicates, it's going to produce that same gene over and over, right? So you're making the clone of the gene uh, every time the bacteria replicate. Um, so the foreign DNA inserted into a plasmid and the recombinant plasmid is inserted into the bacterial cell. Reproduction of the cell make you more uh, newly made foreign DNA. And this makes uh, production of multiple copies of a single gene. So this is a, just a picture to show you how genetic engineering works. So here your bacterial cell, the regular chromosome is a plasmid, all right? So you, you take this plasmid out and then you take a gene of interest, for example, in human, this is how we do insulin production nowadays. You take human gene that makes insulin and, and then you, um, you treat them with a particular enzyme called um, restriction um, endonucleases. The restriction endonuclease enzyme will cut the gene at specific places. It cuts, right? So when you cut the uh, uh, plasmid and you cut the specific human gene and you combine them together and you add another gene called DNA ligase. The DNA ligase function is to seal the cut part of the gene together. It's like a tape. It tapes them together, right? So you take the plasmid, you take the gene of interest from human cells, in this case, say insulin production, and you treat them with endonuclease to cut it and cut it here and put them together uh, in the test tube and you put a DNA ligase and it makes um, the cut DNA, uh, make a, a cut DNA and, uh, and to seal them back. And then you insert that back into the bacteria, all right? And then the bacteria, every time it re, uh, reproduces, now this is a recombinant DNA. There's a plasmid from bacteria, human gene here, right? So and this is now a recombinant DNA. Every time the bacteria replicates, now you make clones of this gene, identical gene, right? You can do one way, you can harvest this gene and do whatever you want. You can put the gene back into human and the people that have uh, diabetes and insulin, um, you know, deficiency. Um, you can harvest a bunch of this gene and put them back into there and hopefully the, the 
it will take the gene and put the corrective genes uh, in the in the place of defective gene like that gene therapy okay are you allowed this bacteria to express this gene and make the protein for you i uh, you, you can use that protein purify this protein and make insulin out of it so this is how insulin is made nowadays all right and the insulin is purified this is where the chemical engineer comes and and and, uh, and they do the scaling up of you know fermentation process I and mean, reactor process and make this recombinant um, E. coli to multiply and purify the protein. All that comes into play. So here's some example of you can make the clone and you can express the protein itself in bacteria. So harvest the gene. So you got the genes and insert the gene into a plant. For example, if you want a plant to modify. Uh, resistant to a pesticide or insecticide, uh, you can put that in, that's a genetically modified um, organism. You can put a specific gene in a bacteria to clean up contaminated site. Okay. And then you can, you know, put in the um, uh, product itself and it, as a protein, for example, human growth hormone, you can make this growth hormone inside a bacterial cell. And now you purify that uh, protein and, and give it to uh, people and they can you know, use that. Uh, here's another example of protein dissolved blood clot in heart attack therapy. And that protein is now produced in, um, in bacterial cells. So this is basically genetic engineering. You're manipulating um, bacterial gene and human gene, put them together. The two major enzymes are the enzyme called restriction endonucleases cut specific places. DNA ligase seal the um, genes back together. So you cut pieces of DNA from two sources and put DNA ligase in a test tube and you make this recombinant DNA and insert the DNA back into the bacterial cell. Every time it replicates, you make a clone, okay? So I'm gonna show you some specific information how they do it. So here's a, uh, as I said before, you take the plasmid, you take the gene of interest from human cell, and then you um, uh, put as, uh, uh, these things together and plasmid put into bacterial cell, and every time it replicates, it's gonna make a clone, okay? Um, and then you can um, express them as a harvest the gene or make a protein, whatever, you, whatever need that you need have, you can use them. So the enzyme I talked about is called restriction enzyme. This restriction enzymes are called restriction endonucleases. So these enzymes, these enzymes cut the molecule at specific places. That place is called palindrome sequence. So palindrome means um, in if you read if you read a letter forward and backward, it spells the same, right? For, for example, mom, M-O-M, mom, you can read it backward, right? That is a palindrome, dad, D-A-D, dad, that's a palindrome. On a DNA sequence, if the sequence can be read forward and backward exactly the same way, that is a palindrome sequence. And these enzymes cut the sequence on the DNA when the sequence can be read forward and backward exactly the same, okay? And the restriction eventually make many cuts and yield restriction fragments that cut small pieces of the car restriction fragment. And then you put this uh, cut DNA uh, with uh, other genes. Uh, and that's, uh, the, the end that's sticking out where the genes are removed is called sticky ends. And then you put them with, uh, uh, is an example of um, palindrome sequence. And uh, you can read the sequence forward and backward, forward and backward, exactly the same. And when you put this restriction enzyme, there are a lot of different restriction enzymes cut in different places. So it's gonna make the cut exactly like this in this part and this part. So this gene is cut and now this is called sticky end. It sticks out in this part of the DNA, it's a sticky end, right? So now all you need to put is another gene that, for example, human gene, if you want to cut that human gene exactly like this and put it back and seal it together, like, sticky tape, put them on, a, um, on the gene and seal it together, exactly like that. So once you put the other, uh, cut gene together and treat them with DNA ligase, another enzyme, it seals and bonds this restriction fragment together. Now you repair that gene, uh, you put a foreign DNA into that place and, you, and cut it together and you make a, a recombinant DNA now, okay? So just to show you how it works, 
So you have the restriction site, which is a palindrome sequence, read forward and backward. You treat them with restriction enzymes. You have a sticky end, and the, 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 the genes are cut. Now this, G, this G DNA is exposed here. It's waiting for exact opposite of um, DNA to combine. And then you um, DNA, uh, the gene that from another source you can add, and then you, uh, is going to pair with exactly what is exposed, is going to pair with uh, uh, another gene from different source. It, and then you treat with them DNA ligase to seal them back. And so you put DNA ligase, DNA ligase will bind. Now this become a regular piece of DNA. Uh, you, if you look at it, this you cut it, you treat it with a restriction fragment with another gene, treat it with the ligase, now it's sticky tape, you put them together and seal the new um, gene. So this is a recombinant DNA. Now you have plasmid genes and you have a, another gene from say humans, pro, human gene in other together. Now this is a recombinant DNA, okay? So these two enzymes are important, restriction enzymes, DNA ligase, restriction enzyme cut, DNA ligase, seal the enzyme back. Um, so you can do that in uh, industrial cloning, you can make it in, you know, you know, this is where engineers comes. When the biologists make this and give it to the engineer, they can make it in a big scale. Uh, in big industry, they make it in, in uh, you know, in thousands and thousands of liter reactor, they produce this, okay. So the gene cloning, uh, the original plasmid is called cloning vector. The plasmid that took it, where you put that uh, piece of a human gene is called cloning vector. Uh, cloning vector is a DNA molecule that carry the foreign DNA into the host and replicate there. Okay. So here's another example to show you uh, how um, uh, a, a gene from a hummingbird and E. coli are combined together with the same example. Okay. Um, so they use the same principle of using these two enzymes and took a piece of a bacterial gene, a piece of a hummingbird gene and put them together. So here's a bacterial plasmid that um, cut with the restriction enzyme. Now it's all open and cut. You have sticky ends sticking out. And then you have the hummingbird genes that uh, you know went for metabolizing sugar. Um, and then you um, cut them gene and it has a sticky end too. And then you put the, um, ligase and combine them together, you can the recombinant plasmid, put them back in E. coli and played it out to show you which one is um, carrying the gene, which one is not carrying the gene that express with a different color, okay? So here is the colony carrying recombinant um, DNA, here is a, a colony carrying, not carrying the recombinant DNA, it expressed differently, okay? Uh, just to show you the same thing in more details, okay? how this process works. So this is basically genetic engineering. You cut and seal. You cut the uh, plasmid, which is a cloning uh, vector, and you put the piece of DNA that you wanted to um, express, and you seal them together and insert in a bacteria, and bacteria will replicate it for you. And this is where engineers, again, come to uh, at industrial scale to make them. And just to show you in close-up view how it is done, and uh, in order to know that uh, this, uh, this research has been done for a lot of different things. And, uh, and nowadays you can do this genomic library that is basically using bacteria, the collection of recombinant vector clones produced by cloning DNA fragments from entire genome. You don't have to do this anymore. Now it, you can refer genomic library and it shows you which enzyme to use and which enzyme will, uh, will cut and which enzyme will seal and which part of the DNA will go. That is called genomic library. So genome will already made using bacteriophage and stored as a collection of phage clones. So you can buy this now. And it's, this technology getting cheaper and cheaper nowadays. Um, so now this, this, um, this library, how they do it is they use the artificial chromosome that called bacterial artificial chromosome because the chromosome from plasmid is so small, right? So you can only have a small piece of uh, information. So and they, they use these bacterial uh, artificial chromosome called Bach, and you can make this library bigger and uh, you can store the genomic library. And um, so this is how it has become an industrial scale 
and um, um, these the companies the biotech company now sell them you can uh, if you check their catalog it, it shows whichever um, uh, library whichever clone you need they will supply to you okay uh, just to showing how the genomic libraries are made uh, in using the bacterial artificial chromosomes is a large plasmid it can have more uh, information there okay this is another type of vector basically okay so now i'm going to introduce another concept called complementary dna which is called cdna library so i so far we talked about information from dna to rna right so you can make um dna from an rna so if if you have a piece of messenger rna you can make a dna because whatever codes on a messenger rna if you put a nucleotide pools in a test tube it's going to pair with whatever rna has for, for example if rna has a, cy a cytosine c it's going to combine with a guanine g right c pairs with g u pairs with um, ad adenine always pairs with um, um, you know uracil so if messenger rna has a code if you put a nucleotide pool in a test tube you can make a dna Right, so that is called complementary DNA, which is basically making a DNA from a messenger RNA. Right, nowadays, you, if a cell expresses a messenger RNA, if you want to make the DNA, you can make the DNA from a messenger RNA. That is called complementary DNA, and this has already been done. And there is a library available for C, C DNA library uh, with a lot of genome information that uh, shows. Uh, transcription of mesh RNA in the original cells. So this is, in order to do that, you need a specific enzyme called reverse transcriptase, the reversal of transcription. That's why it's called reverse transcriptase. So here is an example of how cDNA is made. Um, uh, so here is your messenger RNA that is expressed in a bacteria or expressed in a human cell. You can take that messenger RNA um, and then and take the messenger RNA out of the cell, and then you put them in a, in a test tube and treat them with reverse transcriptase and add some nucleotide pool. You can buy the nucleotide pool from Sigma. Uh, and then this nucleotide pool, wherever that uh, messenger RNA has an A, it's going to combine with T, and, 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 and it makes a, a complementary copy of a piece of DNA. Okay. And once you made the DNA, then you add a DNA polymerase and put more nucleotide pool, then you can make a double standard copy of a DNA. Okay. So this case, this enzyme is important, this reverse transcriptase. And this was possible because of this enzyme is common in viruses and in nature. So people start doing research on this enzyme. Now they're making industrial scale. Now you can make uh, from a messenger RNA, a double stranded DNA, you can make and so here is a cDNA completely made from a messenger RNA. You reverse it, you make a double stranded DNA. And this kind of DNA you make from messenger RNA is called complementary DNA, called cDNA. And this is also now um, available in cDNA library all around the world. You can buy from biotech companies. Okay. Um, so uh, now I'm going to talk about a um, uh, little bit about uh, 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 screening a library for clones carrying gene of interest. Uh, you, know, the, you can, when you make an industrial scale, you make the clone, right? Like the genetically identified copy. And those clones uh, carry different function for a different protein. And then you can express them with nucleic acid probe and see whether it expresses in a cell. That process is called nucleic acid hybridization. Okay. So, you can, you can synthesize a probe, and if you think your cell uh, is working or not, the cell is functioning or not, you put the piece of probe into the cell. If it has a matching pair, it's going to hybridize. It's going to match with it. Wherever C, G is going to combine, wherever T, A is going to combine, it's going to hybridize, right? If it hybridizes, that means your cell has a particular piece of um, uh, gene expressed. That is called... Um, nucleic acid hybridization. You can do that in a test tube or a plate. You can do that nowadays. The DNA probe can be used to screen large number of clones simultaneously uh, to see whether what kind of gene you 
uh, you wanted to make in bioprocess industry. Okay. So once you identify the clone carrying the gene of interest, you can culture them, you can put them in E. coli and reproduce them in large scale. So here's an example of how it works. So you, you, you want a, a piece of um, gene that you want to see, and uh, you put them in this uh, nylon membrane, and you tag them with a radioactive label tag, and you, you wanted to uh, get from um, library all the uh, piece of uh, nucleic acid and pair them with on top of them. And then you, if there is a matching pair, it's going to hybridize, right? These are all single-stranded um, probe. And you put the probe of interest and it's going to probe and it's going to combine. If it combines, it's going to light up because we they put the radioactive label probe, okay? And um, this is how you can see what kind of genes are expressed in a in a, in a cell, and if it is not expressed, then you had to insert the gene to express them. Okay. Um, so if you wanted to insert a foreign gene into a cell, uh, you need to um, do that by a technique called electrophoration. It's basically uh, applying an electrical shock, uh, a pulse electrical shock, and you open up the cell membrane. So the gene that you want to put it into a cell uh, after you make the, uh, the recombinant DNA in a test tube and you give a shock to the bacteria, the plasma membrane opens up, then the D DNA you put into the test tube will go into the bacteria and the bacteria will now put it inside in its gene and you make the recombinant DNA. So that process of giving mild shock is called electrophoration. So electrophoration opens up the plasma membrane, the DNA will be incorporated into the bacterial uh, genome. Um, so it's remarkable like uh, these bacteria can take all kinds of gene from human, from plants, from, uh, because the, the codes are universal codes, only the four letter, right? So if the letters are there, it matches, it's gonna take it up. So, so for example, you can see the bacteria can take eukaryotic protein up. Any gene you put in the bacteria can take it. And, and then if you look at the vertebrate and invertebrate uh, that expresses the eye, um, it's the same gene. You can put a vertebrate gene into invertebrate and invertebrate into vertebrate, you can substitute because the gene hybridized and it can pair because it's a function is the same. So this is basically is what um, makes uh, uh, genetic engineering possible because of this, the code is universal and the bacteria takes up any code you put in, it takes it and substitutes and make uh, um, its own uh, uh, um, genome expression changes. Okay. Um, another uh, thing you already familiar with is called PCR nowadays. You did the COVID test, PCR test. Uh, what is PCR? It's a polymerase chain reaction. Uh, basically you are making a piece of DNA amplifying it several thousand million times in a test tube. So all you need to do is you heat, cool, and replicate. So when you heat the DNA, the DNA falls apart in break, uh, the double standard opens up, and, uh, and, uh, uh, and then you cool it down, and then you add the nucleotide pool with uh, the polymerase enzyme, and it builds back that uh, um, new strand of the DNA that falls apart. You, you do this over and over and it become a chain reaction that is called PCR. So I'm gonna show you how it works. So if you wanted to take a, this piece of genome that you wanted to make millions of copies of them, you first isolate them with restriction um, endonuclease enzyme, you break it open, and then you take that piece in a test tube and you heat it up. When you heat it up, the double strand break and become single strand. Now this one strand open, all you need is whatever code it is there. If there is A, you need a T. If it is a C, you need a G. If it is a G, you need a C, right? So you put the nucleotide in a test tube, the, the nucleotide pool, and, um, uh, and then you add this polymerase enzyme, DNA polymerase enzyme, okay? The three steps involved, denaturation, which is heating, double strand becomes single strand, aniline, which is adding this first piece of primer to start the process, uh, wherever there is A, T is combined, and then extension. 
put all their nucleotide, it, it makes a new piece of DNA, right? Nuclear. So that is called denaturation, annealing, and extension. And repeat this process over and over and over in a small test tube, and you make millions and millions of copies of genes that you want. And this is polymerase chain reaction. So cut the piece of DNA that you want to amplify and go through these steps. And you can buy these nucleotide pools from any scientific companies. Um, and you need the primer to start the process. And by heating and cooling and adding DNA polymerase, you can make a new strand. And then you heat it again, and this uh, is going to fall apart and make single strand, and then you continue this process and you, you get uh, millions and copies of uh, the gene that you wanted to amplify. So this is the same process just to show you how it works. So here's a new strand put together right here after you break open with a new nucleotide. And now it's repeat the cycle, make more genes, right? So every cycle, you know, you multiply uh, the new product that you make, new new genes you make. Okay. Uh, that is basically PCR. Okay. Uh, let's talk about um, um, there's the sequence and expression of a gene, how a gene is um, expressed now. And uh, so DNA cloning allow, allow researchers to compare genes and allele between individuals and locate gene expression in a body. It also determines the role of gene in an organism. So there are several techniques involved. I'm not, I cut it off uh, because I don't want to um, go through. There are northern blood, southern blood. The basic uh, technique is electrophoresis. I'm going to show that uh, one technique. And uh, um, there are several techniques. I removed it from my PowerPoint. Okay. So gel electrophoresis, what it does is when you, it shows what piece of uh, DNA you have is a very basic um, uh, uh, tool. Uh, so you, you put the DNA in the test tube and you uh, treat with the restriction endonuclease. So it's gonna cut into several pieces. And then you put in a gel and apply um, a, a, a current, electrical current. Um, so when the G DNA cut, yeah, when you apply electric current, the smaller piece move faster, the larger piece moves um, uh, slower slower, right? So when they move across the gel, it's going to form a pattern of DNA. The larger pieces are at the bottom of the gel, smaller pieces are at the top of the gel because smaller pieces move faster. Um, so it's going to form a pattern of genes. That is called gel electrophoresis technique. It's going to form band, basically. What kind of bands are expressed is what you're going to see. So here is the, the technique of electrophoresis. So, so you have the DNA mixture in a test tube. Um, you, you wanna, that, that you wanna see what kind of DNA are there. And you have this electrical current cathode and anode in a gel. And you put it in this valve, you apply electrical current. As I said, um, the shorter piece moves faster, the longer piece moves slower, and it's gonna have this kind of pattern of expression. And that is basically called gel electrophoresis. And this is possible because of a phenomenon called RFLP, called restriction fragment length polymorphism. And uh, everybody's gene is different. Um, so that is basically DNA fingerprinting. So when your gene and my gene are put together in a test tube and treated with the uh, restriction endonucleases, your genes cut in um, in several pieces, my gene cut in several pieces, not in exactly the same location because your sequence is different than my sequence, right? So as a result, when you put it on the gel electrophoresis, your banding pattern should be different than my banding pattern. So if you, this is how they solve the crime nowadays, right? In the DNA fingerprinting. So if you, if you find a sample in a crime scene, like a blood, uh, uh, some DNA, you can, amplify doing a PCR reaction. And then if you suspect a suspect, you take the DNA from the suspect and put that in the electrophoresis. And uh, if the banding pattern matches the DNA collected from a crime scene, then you are the one you know, uh, did the crime, right? So this is basically DNA fingerprinting. And this technique, uh, basic technique of gel electrophoresis. So you can take a sample and do a PCR, amplify the DNA, treat them as restriction endonucleases, and then 
allow this through the gel electrophoresis. So that's how it it uh, it shows uh, you have different banding pattern. That's because of RFLP uh, restriction fragment length polymorphism, which is commonly called DNA fingerprinting. So this is our I showed you restriction fragment analysis is done using electrophoresis. Okay? This is called RFLP restriction fragment length polymorphism. Uh, uh, you can use the same technique to treat. Um, uh, find a patient that has carry a gene that is defective genes, okay? So here's an example of sickle cell patient and a normal patient, and you can do this uh, cutting of genes and put in the electrophoresis. You can see that normal alleles of the gene look like this, sickle cell gene looks like this. So you can see whether the person carrying a genetic defect, um, you can, using this technique, and you can identify that. That, that is basically called electrophoresis. And this is possible for basically for restriction fragment length polymorphism. Okay. And just to show how that works, okay. same thing. All right, now uh, DNA sequencing um, is been now uh, very, very cheap. Now DNA sequencing has become uh, industrialized, commercialized, and all you need is, uh, as I said, uh, any piece of DNA that you want to sequence, you uh, you know, you, you put that fragment and send it to the, uh, the company. They have this uh, lot of different new instruments nowadays, and they can sequence exactly what kind of um, gene sequence um, you have in the sample. Uh, that is basically DNA gene sequencing. Okay. And just to show you how they do it here, but I'm not going to elaborate because it's going to confuse you guys. So again, it's the same technique, the four nucleotide code. And all you need, you're reading it over and over on an industrial scale. You use a, once you make the sequence, you use a laser and laser to read the sequence. And then the laser will show you uh, the, the nucleotide that are longest, the nucleotide that are shortest, and it makes this graph. And, and then from this graph, you can read and see how exactly the genes are aligned, and what sequence they have, A, C, T, G, how it is arranged. And here's an example of short piece DNA and long piece DNA. And nowadays you can read through this instrument um, uh, using laser, okay. Um, so let's talk about how you can analyze gene expression, uh, which is using nucleic acid probe to hybridize with messenger RNA uh, and see whether the gene is expressed. That gene, genes are always present, but it's not expressed, right? How do you find out whether gene is, you know, making messenger RNA, making protein. So in order to do that, you, you take the cell and you have this messenger RNA from the library and put it on the gene. If it matches, that means it's going to make, if it doesn't match it, that means it's not making, it's not uh, doing expression, okay? So that's uh, basically is what gene expression is. Um, we do that by doing in-situ hybridization method, um, you just, you take a piece of DNA, you put the messenger RNA, and you you know hybridize. You put on top of that gene. Basically, it's an agar plate, and you push it down. And now we use this um, um, the labeling. So if it matches and a UV light, it's going to light up. If it doesn't match, it's not going to light up. It's called in situ hybridization technique. Okay, so this is just to show you a piece of DNA, yeah, yeah. wherever it matches, it lights up, and wherever it doesn't match, it, it not lights up. Just to show you whether the cell is expressing a particular a piece of uh, gene or not expressing. That means that whether the gene is turned on, the gene is turned off. You can do that by doing in situ hybridization. Um, uh, and just to show you how micro RA works, you can do this expression of the, whether the gene um, turned on and turned off in larger scale. You can do that in a small piece of chips, which is called biochips or DNA chips. So you put all the genes and put messenger RNA and, and see whether it lights up or not lights up. Uh, you can do that at $300. You can see 3,000 genes in one small slide. So this is how it works. So you take Isolate a messenger RNA, uh, make a, a complementary DNA. That, that means you put reverse transcriptase enzyme, you make a, a, a double-stranded DNA. Um, 
we apply cDNA mixture into a micro RA um, uh, plate, uh, and then you put the DNA fragments representing specific gene on top. And if this gene matches with the messenger RNA, it's going to light up. If it if a yellow color means the gene is expressed, and uh, blue color gene is not expressed. And here is a plate that's showing 2,400 human gene expression in one small chip. It's called microchip or DNA chip, biochip. There are a lot of same same, uh, same name for this. It's, this technique is called microarray technique. And here is a uh, just a picture to show you how that works. Um, how you determine the gene is functioning or not, and you do that using in vitro mutagenesis as mutation is a change in um, um, gene uh, code. When the mutated gene is returned to the cell, the normal gene function might be determined by examining the mutant phenotype, how the phenotype change or not change. You can tell whether the gene is functioning or not. Um, the gene expression is uh, silenced using um, I showed you there is a regulatory RNA. That RNA is called RNA interference RNA, and you can use that RNA to, you know, um, silence uh, gene expression. This RNA will stop. Synthetic double-stranded RNA molecule matches this sequence, and then it blocks the messenger RNA, and messenger RNA cannot, you know, transcribe anymore. That is called RNA interference. Um, and then another thing to know is called this uh, genetic markers called single nucleotide polymorphism. B these are 100 to 300 base pair and called SNPs for short. The SNPs, you can detect them in, by PCR. And this is how you can uh, differentiate um, different disease causing gene using this uh, polymorphism. Uh, everybody sequence, uh, there's a single nucleotide that repeats over and over and different places, and that is called single nucleotide polymorphism. And using that, you can detect um, people have particular disease or not. Okay. Um, I just gonna, I don't know whether you, I'm gonna go through quickly how uh, an organism is cloned, and then I'm gonna come to bioprocessing, okay? So you, you already know the, the first organism clone is this uh, sheep in Scotland, Dolly, right? I'm going to show you the technique, how it is cloned. Um, it is possible because the cells in anybody that have cell, these are called totipotent cells. The totipotent cell can generate a complete new organism because it can differentiate into different um, type of cells, your heart cell, your kidney cell, your brain cell. Those are called totipotent cells. If you get that cell and you can make a whole organism, Okay, from that one small cell. Um, so here is an example of a carrot. You cut the piece of carrot and put in the small fragment and allow the carrot to grow in a test tube because these carrot cells are totally potent cells. It can grow into a root cell, a stem cell, um, small one single cell. And it's gonna grow and make whole carrot and become other plant, right? That's because these cells are totally potent. It can express different part of the organisms. Okay. Um, in cloning, what they do, they take a cell and they replace the, 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 the DNA of a embryo and insert this cell from a um, different part of the organism. In, in, in the sheep, they took the other cell from milk producing other cell. They took a cell and uh, take another sheep ovary and remove the nucleic acid, remove the chromosome completely and insert this uh, other cell into it and put it back into it, another sheep. And that sheep produced exactly uh, a clone of the parent cell where they took the other cell from. So a carbon copy of the, of the gene, of the goat it produced, okay? So because of it's called totipotent cells. Uh, and, and, and the totipotent cells, and just to show you the difference, if you, if you take that cell and it can make the whole organism, but if you take a cell that is not totipotent, um, it can, if you take a, a cell that only produce one type of organ, for in this case, it, this um, cell taken from tadpole from lungs, it only produce lung producing cells, not the whole or organism. 
So you need to have a totally potent cell to make the whole organism. Um, so this is the story of how the DALI was made in, in Scotland um, in 1997, researchers started uh, and produced this um, sheep. So here's how it, it is done. They take the other cell, the milk producing cell of a um, goat, and um, it, it took out the cell, isolate that one particular totipotent cells. And then you take a, a embryo from a donor sheep and you remove the DNA of this um, sheep and you put the other cell back into this um, uh, embryo um, uh, from the uh, donor cell. And then you insert in another surrogate mother and surrogate mother now without sperm <laughs> from this totipotent cell produced a lamb, which is carbon copy, exact carbon copy of this lamb, genetically identical, right? So this is how um, uh, um, genetically identical clones are made, okay? This was uh, uh, in, in done in 97, first organism to be cloned. Now we have cloned almost a lot of different organisms we clone, okay? So just to show the, how they remove the nucleic uh, acids and insert this back into the cell, and put it back into the sheep. And then the surrogate mother developed that into a normal um, sheep, okay? And um, as I say, this is the carbon copy of um, the where the other cell come from. Now we clone the cats, uh, clone dogs, uh, we clone a lot of organisms, cows, uh, all those are cloned. And it has some disadvantage, um, but people are, every year they're overcoming problems that um, had this. For example, Dali died prematurely after a few years. Um, that's uh, the, because of some epigenetic, there is some factor that killed that um, animal, but now they, they can overcome that. Okay. Um, so stem cells, so you can use the same technology to treat patients, okay, so you can, you can take, um, if, a, if you have a defective gene, you get a stem cell from um, an aborted fetus or maybe uh, even, uh, you know, embryonic stage, like two four um, cells, embryonic stage. You can use the gene from that cell to make a correct gene to, to uh, uh, make a, a patient with defective gene, you put the correct gene in there. That is stem cells um, in human and animal research. So here is an example. So you take an embryonic stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are totipotent cells. So you can produce a lot of different kinds of cells. You can make liver cells, nerve cells, blood cells, okay? If you have adult stem cells, it can only produce where you took it from. In this case, you took it from bone marrow, you only produce bone cells, doesn't produce nerve cell, doesn't produce liver cells. So you take embryonic cells, you culture them on a plate uh, and then put them in uh, different culture conditions. It turned into a liver cell, a nerve cell, a blood cell. Or if you take it from uh, uh, your own body and adult cells, wherever you take liver cell, become liver, uh, you can make it a liver cell. Um, uh, if you get it from uh, bone marrow, it become a blood cell. Okay. So you can, you can take this gene that if it is um, defective, you take uh, from another person that has a normal gene, you introduce that gene in here, and then you put it back into the person to correct defective uh, genes. Uh, those are called gene therapy, okay. So researchers are now transform skin cells into embryonic cells. So you don't have to have embryo anymore. So you take your own skin cell and use viruses to manipulate uh, the regulatory gene in the stem cell. And then the skin cells become induced pluripotent cell called IPS. And exactly it's gonna produce whatever cell you wanna produce. So this technology is now main, mainstream now. We treated some you know, disease that, um, that are normally not treated using the patient's own skin cell. You can change into a pluripotent cell. So here's an example. You take a skin cell from a patient and you reprogram the cells and become IPS, which is induced pluripotent cell. 
and this treat, uh, treated iPS cell is now uh, differentiated to whatever cell you want, whether you want a blood type, blood cell, want a liver cell or whatever cell, return the cell to the patient. Uh, hopefully the patient will take that cell back. Most of the time it, it does, but sometimes there is a rejection and patient with, with damaged heart tissue now, you know, the heart tissue repair itself and recover from it. Okay. So this is called the new technology called IPS, uh, which is induced pluripotent style from, from your own skin cells. Okay. Uh, you don't have to have another patient, it's taken from your own uh, cell and reprogram the cell. So this is all basically genetic engineering. So you're manipulating the gene in a test tube, put it back into the in vivo, into the cell and uh, express the function of the gene, okay? So let's talk about uh, many benefits of DNA technology in bioprocessing and uh, different field. And uh, there's a medical application, as I said, you can do gene therapy. Uh, so you can find human gene that are mutated. You can put, uh, you know, genetic diseases and put corrected gene in patients. Um, you can do, uh, you know, uh, sequence the genome using PCR and the SN SNP, which is, uh, I told you, single nucleotide um, um, polymorphism and, and to look for what kind of disease a human has. Um, then you can look for the presence of particular type of cancer, whether you're going to express in the future, you can do it. 20, 30 years before you develop a cancer. Um, so gene therapy is basically what I just mentioned. You can alter uh, the gene that uh, take the defective gene out or put a correct gene back using manipulation in a test tube and put it back into your bone marrow. And, um, and you, you hopefully that bone marrow will take up the gene and you're gonna express the gene again in your body. And uh, just to show how this works, in order to do that, you, we use viruses to insert the gene back. And then that virus is inserted into the bone marrow. Every time the virus replicates, the human gene is replicated inside your body. Uh, and then the, that is taken up in the human cell. Okay. Uh, pharmaceutical product uh, with a lot of um, different um, uh, cancer uh, protein monoclonal antibodies are now produced in various uh, uh, goat milk and cow milk. We put the, the human gene into the um, cows and the goats, they express the milk. When you drink that milk and supposed to cure some of the cancer, uh, this is very common treatment for colon cancer, people use that. Um, and then you have a lot of um, moly synthetic molecule. Like I said, the, the production of um, insulin is basically genetic engineering technology. And then they used that, and the drug imatinib is a small molecule that inhibits overexpression of specific leukemia causing receptor. And this pharmaceutical product are, are basically protein can be synthesized in a large scale. This is where chemical engineers come in. So the bio, bio, biologist and molecular biologists manipulate the gene and give the gene back and you need to make them in large scale, okay, in industrial scale. Um, and protein production in cell culture has been done now. Whole cell culture can be uh, engineered to secrete protein and, and uh, simplify the task of purifying it, all right? Okay, you can make the engineered protein um, exactly what instead of making a complex protein a regular uh, cell, if you put exactly the same gene you want, you don't even have to purify the protein. The bacteria are gonna make the exact protein that you want, right? And all you need to do is scale up. And that's what nowadays they do to make insulin. It's become very, very common. Human growth hormone, very common. And vaccine is now we are making in large scale. That's because of chemical engineers um, scaling up this process. Okay. Um, and, and then the, the way we express human protein in animals is called um, transgenic animals, they're called farm animals. And here's an example of um, goat producing milk and expressing human anticlonal, um, anticancer, anticlonal monobody, um, monoclonal antibody to, to stop some cancer. Okay, especially colon cancer. Um, our, our, the forensic is now regular, uh, regular um, 
um, way to identify who who committed the crime. All you need a piece of sample from a crime scene. Uh, that is because of the DNA fingerprinting. I told you how it works. Restriction fragment and polymorphism. Um, then we use uh, the electrophoresis to um, look at the short tandem repeat to identify some disease we can identify. And then we can do the environmental cleanup. We put correct gene uh, for making specific enzyme to clean up particular contaminated site. Um, but um, you cannot, in the US, you cannot release the uh, genetically modified bacteria in the environment, but you can do it in a control reactor. You can have it in a large scale, uh, treat the contaminated site. Once it's treated, you kill the bacteria. Um, so you don't release the genetically modified bacteria into the environment. So this is, uh, in some cases, people are doing this uh, using genetically modified organisms. That's again, chemical engineering work and environmental engineering work. In agriculture, almost all crops in US are genetically modified. Uh, they are, you know, genetically modified cotton, uh, vegetables, everything is genetically modified. In Europe, people are against most of them. In the US, there's a lot of acceptance of genetically modified product. Okay. Um, just to show you how it works, um, you, you just same, exactly same technique. For example, this called, uh, bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis. It's called BT for short. Bacillus thuringiensis is a natural bacteria that make a toxic protein that kill insects. Okay, so um, all you need is take that gene from the bacteria from Bacillus and put it in a plant and the plant gonna express the toxin. And so the insect, the pests that eat that plant will die. So you don't have to apply any pesticide. And that is called BT product, Bacillus thuringiensis. So you have BT cotton, BT corn, BT wheat, BT tomato. So every crop has BT genes in them now. So you apply less pesticide. So basically you put that gene into the plant, exactly same technique, endonucleases, ligases, and put it back into the plant and plant can have a new trait. So the, one of the common genetically modified is the bacterial gene called Bacillus thuringiensis gene. Um, so the ethical questions now raised by DNA technology, that's always there, government regulations, you don't want to create a uh, Frankenstein monster. So you want to have some control over this, uh, how we are using, not going to be become harmful in the future. Okay. Uh, so the genetically modified organism is a big debate of using it for food. As I said, there has become uh, mostly restrictive in the European Union, but in US, for some reason, public acceptance is there. Okay. Uh, let me talk about um, some industrial scale. So these are the product nowadays we make with genetically modified bacteria, um, antibiotics, hormones, vitamin, acids, solvents, enzymes. And here is some list, industrial product, a microorganism in pharmaceutical, food industry, and you know miscellaneous product um, by modifying genes. This is commercially produced nowadays. Uh, here is the industrial products of uh, microorganism enzymes you can produce, specific enzyme for specific function. So this is application for amylase for what type of function, cellulase for what type of function, uh, proteases, streptokinases. Uh, so wow. this is now, nowadays, you know, commercial scale people are using it. Um, here is another uh, uh, using microbes to make things we need in large scale and numerous complex stages. Um, this is where the chemical engineers come and do the scaling up of bioprocessing. And then biofuels, another um, um, product we use um, genetically modified organism to produce uh, you know, biofuels from lignocellulosic materials, okay? And just to finish up this part, this, uh, this is my research I'm gonna talk about uh, later on in the class. Uh, in, uh, in lecture four, I just want to show you how we did this. So, so to make biofuel from um, uh, sugarcane leaf litter, what we did was we took an E. coli 
and we put genes from two different yeast. One yeast that uh, uh, can make uh, ethanol from glucose, another yeast can make ethanol from xylose, and put it in the E. coli. And then the, the E. coli also makes have gene that make um, other product like acetic acid and uh, other um, solvents. We yeah. knock off the gene, like a knockoff experiment. So we put the genes into this E. coli. And uh, so just to show you what genes we put in there, and then we eliminated a knockoff to remove the mixed acid. We wanted to only produce ethanol. And just to show you what we did, so these are the genes we knocked off to remove the genes from the E. coli. And these are the genes we put in, and it expresses 95% of ethanol. It doesn't produce these products we don't want, and it produces this. So, so we have done that, and we uh, pilot scale, we tested it out just to show you result. And I'm going to talk about it in uh, fourth lecture. Uh, so it's, it's, it's now degrading xylose and it's degrading glucose and making ethanol and making more biomass. So this can make a theoretical yield of um, um, ethanol from uh, using E. coli genetic engineering uh, method. Okay. And just a pilot plant run, we did that just to show the result. So that is my second part. And then, then the last part will be synthetic biology. Now I'll entertain some questions. Uh, Raj? Yeah. Uh, things it may be the third part. Uh, we may not have time. Oh, OK. I will continue with before anaerobic digestion. Yeah. 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 I think so. It's very short. It's only 30 slides. So. Uh, yeah. I think so. Uh, there will be, it might be uh, in the third, uh, in the third class. You Third class, I will start with this and then go to anaerobic digestion. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, sorry about this. I had too many slides, I think. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Okay, I think so. It might be we don't have time for the uh, question and answer because um, probably the student will have to go to the uh, next class. Okay. Next classes. So okay. uh, I think so. Uh, please, you can turn off your uh, presentation file, please. Oh, I think she's already there. Yeah. So I think so. Uh, I would like. Uh, I'm for decision. We 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 don't have yet. Uh, we don't have time for the uh, question and answer. Okay. But, but I think so. Uh, this lecture is part. Uh, there will be uh, another lecture, and in in a, uh, in the next month, uh, next Monday, will be Dr. Himanshu Raje. Yeah. Talking about the introduction to bioinformatics, and then the fifth of March, fifteen uh, of oh, sorry, fifteen of March, uh, there will be fundamental of anaerobic, but it might be starting with the uh, uh, biological Synthetic system. Biology. Yeah. yeah, and then twenty uh, seconds uh, of March will be cellulosic uh, ethanol and microbial feed as biofuel. You have been mentioned briefly, uh, right? Yeah. So that that uh, that one is. So this one is uh, all the lectures and Monday morning lecture is part also, we now is celebrate the 80 years of the chemical engineering education in Indonesia. So that, that the chemical engineering uh, this year, now we are celebrate the 80, 80 years. 80 years, wow, yeah, 80 great. Years. Uh -huh. So I think I would like uh, to thank to Raj, so the, so the uh, next Monday, will be uh, Himan Suraje and also the, but the host will be uh, Dr. Penia. I, 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 I can be there with him too, yeah. Okay. In case. So I would, be, yeah. I'd like to thank to uh, Raj and also to all the, the students, the audience, and then Brian, oh, that's, that's my colleagues, is uh, Susana Lume, so she's the, 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 the alumni of, uh, of, of chemical engineering, so the top of uh, chemical engineering. She, he's a, she's a chemical engineer as well. And also, uh, I think Pariki is also uh, in the YouTube. So I would like to thank to, to you all. Probably, uh, Gunther, could you take the photo session before we are leaving? Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, okay. Please, you, you could put, your, put on your video, please.